mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Advent Savior and King Jesus Christ. Amen, dear Christian friends. Imagine, imagine you're alive and well 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, you're walking the streets of Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of David. And it's crowded and compacted with people. Maybe it's the festival of Pentecost or the season of Passover and there's some 50,000 people there in the city. They're doing the very same thing that you're doing. They're there to see the sights, to worship God, to be there in the holy city in the presence of God. And as you're making your way down the streets, there's people shoulder to shoulder in front and back and side to side and suddenly somebody pulls out a knife and stabs a Roman centurion, and then runs away into the crowd. He disappears. He's gone. He's vanished. I used a butter knife so that I wouldn't poke myself or my worthy example, Mickey. Yeah. That, my friends, is a Sicarii. A Sicarii. Let's all say that together, Sicarii. Yeah, Sicarii. There's a really excellent action-packed movie called Sicario. Has anybody ever seen it? Oh, yeah, I don't recommend it if you are offended by violence because it is a very violent movie. The word Sicario today means an assassin. An assassin. And it goes all the way back 2,000 years to the day of Christ where Jewish individuals, Jewish people, they would band together and there was this secret group, this secret organization and they were known as Dagger Men, which in Latin is Sicarii, literally meaning little dagger. And they would do that very thing. They would go into Jerusalem, they would carry a knife up their sleeve and their robe, and when they saw either a Roman citizen or a Roman sympathizer, somebody who enjoyed the rule of Rome, they would make sure that guy was crowded about, and they would move up toward this individual. They would stick him a number of times, and they would run away. This became such a problem that Rome established special laws with special punishments which were none too pleasant because of the Sicarii. Why do I tell you all of this? For the simple reason that we find ourselves in Acts chapter 23, you'll remember we're making our way through the book of Acts, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He is now in Jerusalem. He has returned. A riot has happened. He's been arrested, right? He stood before the Sanhedrin. A fight breaks out there in the Sanhedrin. The Roman guards have to grab Paul and literally carry him back to the barracks, the very same barracks where Christ was was beaten and brutalized prior to his crucifixion. And now the Bible tells us this. The next morning, we're in Acts chapter 23, verse 12. The next morning. What happened the night before? Does anybody remember? Jesus himself. Jesus in the flesh comes and stands next to the Apostle Paul and basically tells him what? Don't worry. Have no fear. I'm with you. And I want you to go to Rome. Paul, you're going to get to Rome, so have no fear, no worry, no concern whatsoever. No matter what happens between today and the day you walk through the gates of Rome, I will be with you. I dare say that Paul slept like a baby that night, that when he went to bed, laid down on his cot there in the barracks. And think about this as well. This isn't the first time Jesus has been in that location. Approximately 30 years before, 
Christ Jesus, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, was arrested, dragged before the Sanhedrin, judged, assaulted, dragged before Pontius Pilate, who judged him, sent him off to be scourged. Now he is in the barracks, there in the fortress Antonia, being mocked and beaten and abused and whipped and scourged by the Romans in this very same spot. How do you think that made Paul feel? What thoughts do you think Paul was thinking? Because on that very first Good Friday, when people saw Jesus crucified, nailed to the cross, there on Golgotha's hill, they thought that was the end. Jesus cried out, it is finished. And the Bible tells us that he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. There was an earthquake. There was darkness. There was a storm. There's the Roman centurion who said, truly, this was the Son of God. You remember that in the greatest story ever told when John Wayne made a cameo appearance and was the Roman centurion? He said it in such a John Wayne way. Truly, this was the Son of God. You expected him to end the statement with Pilgrim, right? <laughs> Christ had been there, and everybody thought it was the end. And yet, it was the beginning the beginning of spreading the gospel to all the world, the beginning of telling everyone about life and salvation through the crucified Savior, the beginning of telling everyone the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, the very same blood that had at one time stained the pavement there in the fortress Antonia, the very same pavement where Paul now found himself standing next to none other than Jesus Christ. I dare say he was comforted. I dare say he was confident. I dare say he had not a worry or a concern in the world. What a message, my friends, for you and me. Check out Matthew chapter 28 this afternoon, 16 to 20. It's the Great Commission, Go Ye Therefore. We all know the go ye therefore part, right? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You know, we know that. Great commission. We're all commissioned to go spread the word. We get it. But what does Jesus finally say? What are his last words? You know, last words are really important, right? We put a lot of weight on last words. Stonewall Jackson. How many of you know Stonewall Jackson? Not personally, but if you read history, Stonewall. You know the last thing Stonewall Jackson said? Anybody know? Let us cross the river and rest in the shade of the trees. What a great final statement. What a great last thing to say. You know, I think when I die, probably what I'll say is, don't sell all my cars for what I told you I paid for them. Yeah, you know, rehearse your last words. What does Jesus say? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's never a moment in your life where Christ is not present. There's never a place where you can go where Jesus is not there. There's never a trial or a tribulation that you are experiencing where you are all alone. Christ is there. That's his promise. The very promise he made to the Apostle Paul. Look, Paul, I'm with you. I'm going to get you to Rome. A lot of crazy things are going to happen, but you will be in Rome. And Paul said, great, and he went to sleep. And I dare say he slept like a baby that night. The Bible tells us, we're at verse 12, the next morning some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Can you imagine 40 people who want to kill you? Those are the Sicarii, the men with the little daggers. Here, here, 
of their conspiracy. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priest and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we had killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring before you, bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about the case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. Notice the corruption of the leaders. This group of assassins, this group of knife-wielding men, they go to the Supreme Court of the nation of Israel and they are in cahoots with them. Hey, you know what? Tell a lie. Tell a lie. Go over to the commander and say, you know what, that guy Paul, he was here yesterday, things kind of got out of hand, you know, tempers flared, things got a little heated. We want to learn more. You know, who does this remind us of? How about King Herod? Remember when the Magi, the wise men, made their way and they go to Herod's palace? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? And Herod calls out the priest and the priest come and they say, well, according to the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi, or if you're Italian, the book of Malachi. Okay, they open it up, they read, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. Herod turns to the wise men. What does he say? Hey, you go, you find him. When you find him, come back. Tell me where he is because I want to worship him too. That was a lie. That was a deceptive lie. You and I both know Herod did not want to worship the baby Jesus. He wanted to kill him. God warns the wise men in a dream. Hey, Herod. He's pulling your chain. He's lying to you. Go home another way. So they take the back roads back home to Babylon. And Herod becomes enraged by this and he sends his soldiers down there to Bethlehem and they kill all the male children who are two years and younger. On the Christian calendar, that's called the slaughter of the holy innocents. It's on December the 28th. Likewise, the Sanhedrin. They want to murder the Apostle Paul. They, want to, they don't want any more information. They don't want to debate or discuss or investigate and find out what's going on. They say, you know what? You and I will work together. You send a message. Paul will come. When he's on his way, we'll have 40 guys waiting with daggers and we will stab him to death. And until this happens, we're not going to eat a thing. We're not even going to drink. What happens? What happens? This conspiracy against the Apostle Paul. Luke tells us, verse 16, but when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Did anybody know that Paul had a sister? Maybe you never knew that before. Look what Luke is doing. He's giving us a glimpse into the personal life of the Apostle Paul. That Paul, we know he had a mom and dad, right? But he wasn't an only child. He had a sister, and the sister had a son who was Paul's nephew. And apparently, Paul's nephew was with Paul there in Jerusalem. He heard about this plot through the grapevine. How he found out, we have no idea, but found out he did. And he goes to Uncle Paul. Now, what does that tell us? He loved Paul. He loved his uncle, and his uncle loved him. What a, what a personal glimpse into the life of Paul. Did any, anybody here have a favorite uncle? Yeah, an uncle you hung out with all the time, you just loved? Yeah, my uncle Jeff. My uncle Jeff and I, we hung out all the time. I loved my uncle Jeff. As a matter of fact, my uncle Jeff gave me my very first pickup truck, a 1958 Chevy Apache half-ton truck with the floorboards totally rotted out. It was the breeziest automobile I've ever driven. Uncle Paul was loved by his nephew. Why? I mean, are you required to love an uncle? 
You ever have an uncle you didn't like? An uncle you really didn't like being around? An uncle that you didn't get along with? Possible? Uncle Paul was loved by his family. Once again, that gives us a glimpse into the personality of Paul. He was a good guy. He was great to hang around with. He loved his family like you and I love our family, our nieces, our nephews, our brothers, our sisters, our mom, our dad. Likewise, Paul. And the nephew, who is unnamed, goes to Uncle Paul and he says, Hey, Uncle, I, I got some news for you. These guys, these dagger men, they're going to be waiting for you. You're going to be called before the Sanhedrin, but you won't even get there. They're going to stab you to death before you even walk into the building. Beware, be aware, be wary. And so what does Paul do? The Bible tells us, he said, some Jews have agreed to ask to bring, to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin on the pretext of wanting more accurate information. Oh, wait, I jumped too far ahead. I jumped way down to the bottom. Okay. Paul called one of the centurions, we're at verse 17. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand. Note, the commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked him, what is it you want to tell me? Why would they be so nice to Paul? Remember, just days before, they had arrested Paul and tied him to the whipping post and were about to scourge him because this great big riot had broken out and they got him, they dragged him away. Hey, you know what? We're going to question you under duress. We're going to whip the skin right off of your back. And now, suddenly we're buddy-buddy. You remember, maybe... When I asked the question a couple of weeks ago, why did Paul wait so long to reveal that he was a Roman citizen? I mean, there he was, his back bared. They had stripped him of his robe down to his waist. They had tied him with leather straps around this pole. The guy with the whip, the scourge, you know, he's dangling that thing, maybe even showing it to Paul. This is going to get you. And Paul says, you know... Isn't it illegal to whip a Roman citizen who has not been convicted of a crime? You're a Roman citizen? I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. What about you? Hey, I was born a Roman citizen. It's like saying, you know, I, how many of you were born in Florida? Good, good, good. Yes, I'm a Floridian. We're a rare breed, aren't we? Very special breed. How many of you love case tractors? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Paul was born a Roman citizen. He shocked the people around him by revealing his citizenship at the very last moment. And look at the fruit that comes from that last minute revelation. Because you could get in really big trouble if you punished a Roman citizen unjustly. You could even be put to death. So now they want to make nice nice with the Apostle Paul. Now they want to do everything possible to protect him and maybe smooth over that time when he was tied to the post, you know. Because Paul could complain all the way to Tiberius and get these guys in trouble. You see how God works. Now the very people that had imprisoned Paul, the very people that had handled him roughly, the very people that were going to beat him within an inch of his life are now going to extraordinary means to protect him. See how God works. Let's see what happens. What happens to Paul, the Roman centurion, and the commander? The commander took the young man by the hand. Notice his gentleness. He draws him aside. What is it you want to tell me? 
the nephew said, he said, we're at verse 20, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them. Don't do it. Because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed Paul. How long can you go without food? About 30 days. I mean, if you're on a desert island or you're flying over the Sahara Desert, you got a parachute out of your plane, you don't land next to the Hess gas station so there's no Circle K or 7-Eleven, you can go about 30 days without eating. How long can you go without drinking? Four days. Four days and you'll die. If you don't drink any liquids, coffee, tea, water, juice, Johnny Walker, <laughs> you'll die after four days. That's how <laughs> desperate these guys are, okay? That's how desperate they are. That's how much they want to kill him. They are ready now. These guys, they're not going to eat. They're not going to drink. They're ready right now. They're waiting for your consent. They think, yeah, not a problem. We'll take them over there. They're waiting for your consent to their request. Verse 22, the commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Play shut mouth. Keep your mouth shut. You and I, we know. I'm going to get everything ready. Don't spoil my preparations. What do we learn? What do we learn from this? First and foremost, this Roman commander and these Roman soldiers, this Roman centurion, they're not Christians. They're not Christians. They worship Mars, the god of war. They worship Jupiter, whom they believe is the king, the prince among gods. Okay, they worship Vesta. You probably heard in movies or read in books of the Vestal Virgins. Vesta was the goddess of hearth and home in Roman society. These are pagan men. And yet, God uses them. God uses them to fulfill his promise and to accomplish his purpose. What does that say to you and me? God can use you. How many people are perfect? Raise your hand if you're perfect like me. Oh, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> you know, yeah. Not a single one of us are perfect. We've all sinned. We've all done things we shouldn't have done, great or small. Okay? We come to God in heartfelt confession, God, I am not worthy to be in your house, yet by your invitation, you have invited me here. You know what God loves to do? He loves to forgive. Think about it. What does God say about our sins? I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, and I will remember them no more. God not only has perfect forgiveness, but perfect forgetfulness as well. I've said that a thousand times. I say it again. God loves you so incredibly much that he gave his son for you. Yes, sir, Jeffrey. <laughs> God uses imperfect people. Think of Moses. Why did Moses flee to the wilderness? Why did Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner not get along, right? I remember when I was a little boy and I watched that movie and Charlton Heston is going off into the desert and Yul Brynner's riding back to Egypt. And I thought, you know what? I just go hide over that hill over there and wait till night and go back home again. Good thing Moses didn't, otherwise he would not have met God, met God on Mount Sinai. Here is a murderer. Remember, he killed a man. Here is a murderer. And God said, I can use you. Go back to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Out in the wilderness, you're going to climb Mount Sinai and you're going to see me and I'm going to give you the... Ten Commandments, the law of God. You're going to sit down and write the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. You're going to do that, Moses, and you're not perfect. Think about Paul. Paul, who by his own admission, 
Chief among sinners, says the Apostle Paul by his own confession. It's where we get the hymn, Chief of sinners though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Died that I might live on high, lives that I might never die. As the branches to the vine, I am his and he is mine. Why did I have to sing that all by myself? Don't you know that hymn? Yeah, here's Paul, an imperfect man by his own admission. We don't know the name of the commander. We don't know the name of the centurion. But we know that they were not perfect men. And God used them. God can use you. God can use you for his mission and ministry. And maybe it's something simple. Maybe it's a prayer for somebody who's sick. Maybe it's a word of encouragement for somebody who's depressed and down. Maybe it's a word of guidance to somebody who's searching and confused. God can use you. How many times have I said it? Tell your story. Every single one of us can look back on how God has blessed us in life. I was reading a devotion this morning on the richness of God's blessings in our lives and I couldn't help but say yes and amen. I look at my life and I see how God has provided and rescued and guided me for 60 years now. There's never a moment in those 60 years where God said, hey, I'm busy, I don't have time for you. Likewise you, my friends. Which leads us to the second thing we learn. Jesus promised, you're going to go to Rome, Paul. You're going to be there. You're going to tell all the power people in Rome about me and about my gospel. You're going to be there, Paul. Did Paul go to Rome? Well, I don't want to give away the end of the story, but yeah, Paul makes it to Rome. God keeps his promise. God always keeps his promise. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God and cast all of humanity into sin, God promised that he would send a savior. Before Christ Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, a position of power and authority, what did he say? I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. I mentioned it just a few short moments ago. Christ Jesus will never abandon you, ever. Christ Jesus promises to forgive. Maybe this isn't you. But I'm sure there's at least somebody here today who has a, has a burden of guilt over something they did, maybe, maybe yesterday, maybe 30 years ago. But what does the Bible say? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Is there a sin so great? that Christ cannot forgive? No. No. Bring that to the altar of God. Confess that sin because Christ wants not only to forgive you, but to assure you of his forgiveness. Believe it! Believe it! God keeps his promises, just like he did with Paul. What happens next? You know what? We'll find out next Sunday. And all God's people say, Amen.